from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mamet. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me joining from the East Coast from the United States, Nick. Nick, thank you very much for being with me today on the show. The way I love to do it is usually I keep it to my guests to introduce themselves. So the floor is yours. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to meet you and speak with you this morning. Uh, I'm sure it's a different time zone over in Dubai. I'd love to learn more about what it's like over there. It seems like a fascinating city. I've never been. Uh, my name is Nick Larizio, and I'm the CEO and founder of AstuteTechnologist.com. We have our own unique AI tool, AI Advisor. Astute Advisor, uh, as well as Astute Connect, which is our IP and intellectual property surrounding uh, a new platform and a new way to connect the buyer and supplier uh, on the IT side, thinking like a modern um, service delivery model, much like a DoorDash or Grubhub. That's great. And yeah, of, of course, like uh, hopefully one day this is what I tell all my guests to, to, to meet you in person. Either here you come to this part of the world or when the chance comes and I go back to, to the United States if, you know, if you are from the United States and I have a lot of guests from there. So, you know, we have a lot to cover today uh, with you, Nick, but I would love to start from an area where you focus too much on, which is the small, medium businesses, you know, and the... This area is a little bit close to my heart because, you know, I think it needs a lot of attention and, you know, um, it's like underrated, I would say. So the first question is, how do you think small and medium sized businesses can leverage the technology to compete with larger companies? Absolutely. So SMBs are the, and I hate acronyms, right? It's confusing. Not everybody might understand them. So I try and use them as little as possible. So. SMBs, small, medium-sized businesses, are the backbone of the United States. They always have been. That is where innovation occurs and happens, right? Uh, they're more nimble and able to adapt quickly to change. Um, you know, they might not have the resources that large enterprises have to combat the growing threat of cyber attacks. So I see protecting them as, as my core mission at Astute and our core mission at Astute. Um, really, what I would like to do is kind of build out a franchisable model or system that can service this market at rapid scale, um, first across the United States and then looking at other markets such as Dubai. That's fantastic. So, you know, like the, I just want to highlight one thing. So I think it's common. And again, I'm with you. I, I, I don't like acronyms sometimes too much, except, you know, that they make the lives easy. So, the in definition, you know, like these are the companies, you know, that they have certain number of employees or they do like certain or less than certain number of, uh, of revenue per year, right? Now, here, uh, when it comes to, to technology, right? So what do you think are the most common challenges uh, these companies they face? And how do you aim to help them to overcome that? And plus, you know, especially um, we are in an age where we talk about very, very advanced stuff like AI, machine learning, and all this. So how do you think that you can help this sector of the business, knowing that also, if you allow me, that in all statistics, and this applies to the U.S. and it applies even to other, uh, other parts of the world as much as I research, that these companies, the small, medium businesses, they form a large chunk of the economy. So in some places, they are like more than 80, 85% of the economy comes from these SMBs or small, medium uh, businesses. Absolutely. And that's where a lot of people start their career professions. 
Um, many of them are privately owned and operated. So they're all run a little bit differently when you look at their tech stack. And I see the biggest challenge here is disparate tools and systems. You might have a network stack of, of five different, you know, switch partners, right? And, and what happens is, is you have competing forces and competing salespeople for that business. And that's really a legacy model. We need to kind of roll out some standardization, um, looking at the different aspects of the IT um, stack here, the technical stack. So when I look at partnering with Cisco, Cisco Meraki for simplicity, um, you know, standardizing um, those across the board, looking at tools like Microsoft 365 and Enable for the front end, looking at backend uh, database partners like Oracle, strategically aligning myself with these, with these vendors um, for these specific factors or, or factions of the IT stack is gonna be a key element so that we don't have competing forces within my own company. Um, really scaling that out and building it from the ground up as opposed to what private equity has done, which is now it's come in after the pandemic with a lot of the project work stopping um, and they're buying them up. They're buying, you know, I've worked in the M&A space, mergers and acquisitions, um, and, and they're buying up these 20, 30 year old MSPs left and right. Uh, and then they're consolidating and, and folding them and bringing them to an on-platform service model, which is kind of similar to what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I, let's come in from the ground up, let's standardize, let's roll it out, let's get, um, let's look at new markets and new cities and new frontiers in the United States where people have relocated in recent years, and, and let's build this thing out. Uh, that's, that's perfect, Nick, but do you see that actually the owners of these businesses are understanding, you know, um, the things that we share? And wh why do you think that? Now, well, of course, like we, we do here on the show and, you know, I do this also like outside of the show as part of a, uh, my work as an advisor and consultant to some companies, we try a lot to tell them about the benefits whether, you know, it's a little bit on now overused word, which is the digital transformation, for example. And sometimes we talk about cybersecurity and sometimes, and the answer is always that comes to me, mm, you know, like, yeah, this is only for the big guys. Like, well, what should I do with AI? Why do I need cybersecurity? What is this digital transformation going to change for me? So how do you deal with such conversations? Like, I'm very curious to know. Absolutely. So what I like to say is it's not really a threat. It's a change in culture. And that's what I always said with digital transformation, right? And remote working. And it's amazing how fast the, the pitch changes. For a long time, it was a race to the bottom. I'm going to have five different vendors compete for my service. Or, you know, so really what we're saying here is it's no longer a race to the bottom. What, what, what's going to happen is you're going to have a massive 80% increase in time. Your employees are going to have a lot more efficiency to think creative, innovate, and focus on that R&D budget. So we want to increase that, that messaging of, hey, it's not a threat to your business. It's actually going to make you more nimble. It's going to allow you to have more free time to you know, simplify those, those automated redundant tasks of data entry and so on so that you can actually innovate and, and create new solutions, uh, products and services for your market. And I think it makes a lot more sense because usually they don't have the enough resources, uh, especially when you know, it comes to anything that can help them increase the revenue, it can help them increase their number of customers and so on. So, you know, because you touch on the automation, for example, and this is also something that last year in 2023, I was doing a lot to show that uh, automation might be needed more by small, medium businesses than of course, the large enterprise, they need it, but these guys, they figured it out and they started to put, you know, a budget for, for automating their processes and procedures. But uh, in, SM, in the SMB world, that makes more sense, honestly, because, you know, you want to do less with more always now, uh, which is something I believe, you know, they, they need really to invest in. Now, one of the things, you know, to, to, to close the, 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 on the sm small medium business part and shift to something else. Um, it is about, you know, they are usually worried or let's say they always try to find out how, you know, whatever investment they're going to do, uh, it would be immediate. So 
How, but do you think this is right? Like, how do you think these companies should approach investing in new technologies, considering maybe, and I can understand this again, and to, to what you were just saying, that they might have limited budget. So how do you approach this? In, or how they should approach this in your opinion? Right. So it has to be a SaaS model, because when you look at things like the traditional break-fix project work that was not sustainable throughout the... Uh, the pandemic or a massive crisis, like right now I see cyber attacks as the biggest threat to our nation's security as well as globally. So really what, what we need to do is prepare for, for not if it's going to happen to you, it's when it's going to happen to you and when you get attacked and your operations could be potentially shut down. So I see a large focus on prevention, not just remediation, but we need to prevent uh, and monitor 24 seven for the, the, ongoing threat of cyber attacks so that your operations are not at risk. It's about building out a SaaS model budget. So on a monthly recurring basis, it's the same fee over a fixed term that you pay just like you would a rent for an apartment every, each month that is going to go towards the SaaS model so that even though a crisis is happening, you still have this in your budget and uh, your IT partner is going to be readily available to service you uh, in the event of a cyber attack. That's great advice, I would say. So now let's uh, like shift gears and talk about, you know, AI, right? And I know that like, you like to do, uh, you know, let's call it myth busting, <laughs> some facts. So what do you think are the biggest misconception, misconceptions about AI in the business world? <laughs> yes, I like the truth. The truth is uh, always important here. So. We've built out our own AI tool, which runs on its own private environment, um, segregated off of the open uh, source network. And, and it's really working with whoever owns or the creator of that AI. You want to trust that person. You want to make sure that it's not feeding you information that is inaccurate or misinformation. You want to make sure that it's correct and, and going. it's in your best interest. So building out a student advisor and engaging with that AI on a regular basis, it's learning from me and it's applying a lot of the same strategies that I've applied to get my business to where it's at today. So I think it's really important to, to look at the owner or the creator of the AI. Um, you know, revenue share models are really great. So it's, you know, it's, it's a, essentially it's a, a free tool that you can use. Um, however, I, I generate, um, you know, money from, from that revenue share. So it's fine. Um, yeah. So use a suit advisor, engage with it. It's learned a lot from me. Um, it's, it's in your best interest and, uh, yeah, don't, don't always trust these, these random bots and, and marketing that you see. Yeah. The other day, uh, I wrote a friend, you know, because I, he, he's into marketing and uh, copywriting. And I showed him, <laughs> I showed him some of the, uh, recently received, uh, you know, emails and I tell people, look, like use AI smartly, right? So the AI is just a tool and you need to, to use it really, really smartly because what, what I've seen people they're doing is that they just copy paste blindly, for example, from something like chat GPT or which is, look, I use chat GPT on daily basis. I think there's no one else who, who use chat GPT. And I'm saying this literally, you know, I interact with the tool maybe more than 20 times per day, you know, uh, but at the end of the day, at least, you know, I take what I think it's right. And I do my uh, reasoning before just relying blindly on the AI. And yeah, so, so to your point, like, um, we need to be cautious when we use the AI, but do you think that AI can contribute in like, for example, decision-making processes for companies? Absolutely. So this is where the human element and the ethics portion comes in. And that's where you have to look at the creator. So this is where, oh my gosh, you know, I have eight adults and, and two children, right? And who am I going to save? So AI does not do a good job at that type of reasoning. So there's always going to be that element of, of human oversight that, that needs to be there. Now I've refined my tool specifically, right? And I always use the analogy of a, a painter's brush right? That's how I see uh, AI, right? The work, the output is, is the property of the owner, the copyright of the owner. Um, but, you know, it's an, it's an amazing revolutionary tool that's going to that's gonna reshape our world. So 
I think it's I think it's fantastic. However, it is important to to really note that ethics uh, portion of it. Um, now, what's great is since it's learned from me, um, you know, I've I've been able to refine and release a second version of my book. I've been able to refine my patent. I've been able to refine and and tweak a lot of different things within my business, from the website to how I write emails. Um, you know, a lot of strategies from personal experience that I've had in the past have been applied to my specific tool. And what's worked for me in the past, um, you know, it will certainly work. Absolutely. Now, it, it's a, you know, uh, it's very obvious that uh, AI will become a part of the day-to-day -day operation and it will be part of the, um, you know, the way we, we do our work, whether it's on a uh, personal level or if we are a business owner or even if we gonna still be part of, of another company. So how do you think businesses should prepare their workforce for an AI driven future? And it's a fact, like no one can say, no, AI would not, uh, will not be part of that. So how we can get prepared? It's going to be a cultural shift, right? Managers are gonna have to understand that their employees are gonna have a large portion of their time freed up. Um, you're going to have to focus on the relationships with your customers. You're going to have to understand that creative work has re-entered the world. Um, so really what this is doing is it's, it's automating things like data entry. It's automating things like standardizing invoicing and, and really just mundane tasks. So people are going to have extra time on their calendars and it's focusing on the creative work. It's making sure that people stay healthy. Um, you get outside, you go take a walk, you, you ground yourself in reality. Um, you know, it, it's going to be cultural. It's going to be a mindset shift. You know, I, I always use the analogy of uh, people like to be told what to do for the most part, um, which is, is interesting to me. Um, you know, so don't worry so much that your staff is going to leave. Don't worry so much that there's going to be widespread panic, you know, especially if people have been sticking with you for a long time. Um, kind of allow this stuff to be introduced at a steady pace throughout your organization and watch, watch how much magic is, is really going to take place. Um, it's going to be awesome. We're living in the creator economy, the influencer economy, like Cisco CEO came out and said, I want all 60,000 or some, some odd, uh, employees to, to now be influencers. Um, so it's really, it's really interesting. You're going to see a lot of competition in marketing You're going to see a lot of, um, new business uh, models and ideas take shape. And it's a, it's a really exciting time, especially in the United States. Now, that's a good point there. I've seen this uh, famous post from, from Cisco. But the question here is how we, we can stay, be unique, right? Because uh, if everyone out there is going out and trying to do the same thing and people who follow me knows my own view on trying to be unique. Of course, we, I know that we cannot be unique all the time. I know like this is, we, we are, we are by nature. We like to do what we see other people doing, but still when it comes to doing a business, right? Or when you go and you say, I'm going to be a thought leader, right? So you must be doing something completely different. I mean, in a sense, not everyone can be like, I don't know, like the Gary V or not, not everyone can be, you know, that special guy. I understand, including myself, right? But I'm a little bit skeptical and I'm not skeptical by, by default that we're going to be like just seeing us acting based on like some pre-scripted acts and some pre-scripted processes, and we're gonna be very robotic. What do you think on that, Nick? Well, what makes you you? And that's what's so special about the United States. I see a lot of value in the community, right? You're seeing this large push for buy local here. This is a, what's amazing about our country here. And I, I have an appreciation. I'm actually, I have an Italian background, Larizio. So that's what makes me me, right? I have an appreciation for that. I'm East Coast. I'm New England. I'm a Boston born. I now live in New Hampshire. We're known for seafood, right? So we have the best seafood, right? So there's a uniqueness to the local community and an appreciation 
for those differences that, that make us unique. So that's why I'm actually very fascinated with a franchise model, right? You look at a legacy model like a Geek Squad, which claims to service, they, they went uh, mostly to consumer, but they also service the SMB space. But I don't think they do it very well, and it's still on an hourly model for, for much of it. Um, and, and Best Buy bought them, and you know, they're actually responsible for about $2 billion a year for Best Buy in revenue, which is, pretty, which is a pretty shocking statistic. So if I can just go after some of that market, that's fantastic. Um, I'm understanding that you know, if I can just design the system and then franchise it out to local owners, there's going to be a little bit of a difference in every right? And how we price and then how we um, secure and, and um, monitor the information in that community that keeps it unique and keeps it the way it's always been. That's, yeah, I, I hope so, Nick. I, I hope so, right? Uh, and the, the audience know, they, they, I'm, I'm optimistic and I hope, you know, we, we can always remember, look, you, you mentioned some fantastic things uh, about, you know, how everything can be given this uh, unique identity part, whether it's like from cultural background, whether from geography background, whether from community background. I love this answer. And I wanted people to hear this from you, Nick, because I think we need to hear this more. So I couldn't agree more about uh, that part that you just mentioned, because, yeah, so, so this is what reminds us, as you said, where, where we're coming from, why we're here, why we're doing these things. Now, an area that I know you specialize in, and I think I, I, I covered what I used to do last year, some uh, solo episodes. I was just talking uh, to the audience for like short episodes. Uh, the Internet of Things, right? So, and I know you talk a lot about the Internet of Things, IoT, you know, again, another acronym. Uh, so what are you seeing uh, or like what's, let me ask you a different uh, way. What are the ways you think IoT or Internet of Things is currently transforming traditional industries? Yeah, absolutely. So IoT, when I think of IoT, I think of like Web 1, Web 2, Web 3, which is being adopted early already. Um, and that's going to be the decentralization and the financial aspect, cutting out the intermediary. We're seeing a lot. Um, it's the use of cryptocurrency. It's, you know, we, we started out and, and with basic Web 1 and then, uh, you know, we were running we went to web two where it was a lot of uh, revenue was brought in by advertising and, and static kind of pictures on, on websites and everyone was going to a website. Um, you know, what is the point of a website today? Um, you know, that's a very interesting topic. Um, you know, it, hopefully people can read and learn a bit more about my business, but it's, it's so easy today to just spin up a website with, um, so I'm seeing the IoT change, particularly around the financial aspect, right? How we transact business is, is huge um, with little oversight. And then looking at Web4, looking at that next frontier of, okay, we actually need to capitalize on this thing. It's great that we're living in the Wild West right now. But like, we, you know, we need to make a little bit of money here. Um, how are we going to do that? And then how are we going to protect these uh, communities and their units as well? Um, you look at AI and what it's even done on the, from the CTO's point of view on things like auto deploy. Um, you know, you're able to take configurations of legacy devices and migrate them, um, you know, in, in, in minutes. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very crazy. Things are happening very fast. You're not going to see a lot of value in like hourly billing, right? So it's, it's going to be, Keen interest on protecting those those facets of business, which uh, is unique. Absolutely, and you know, how do you think uh, you know this technology, the Internet of Things, can allow us to have like better practices when it comes to also something like. Uh, eco-friendly business practices, sustainability, and, you know, smart cities and all these things. So, so how do you think this can, can contribute? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I see a lot of our infrastructure 
being very dated. A lot of it was developed around the Cold War times. So I see when I think about sustainability, I think about what's going to really cause us to come in and update a lot of these legacy systems like our water supply, computer controls, right? Like how we're getting our electricity. Those types of things are, are really um, need to be protected in our society from external threats. Um, so, you know, what's going to drive us to do that? It's, it's threats like foreign nation states, right? It, realizing the impact of, of what having those systems be shut down, what that could do to our society and movies like Leave the World Behind. So, which I don't want to do. I like the world. So, you know, how, how, can we, um, how can we update these systems to protect ourselves from, from future attacks from foreign nation states? Um, that's really going to drive us to, to make these types of changes because the reality is, is if our critical infrastructure gets attacked, you know, it's going to be widespread panic for over 100 million people in major cities, um, like virtually overnight. So, yeah, we need to we need to protect those assets uh, critically. Absolutely. And this brings me to something which is related to the Internet of Things. And again, like I discussed it last year, uh, which is edge computing. Right. So. I want the audience to hear it from you, like why edge computing is something that uh, is different from the traditional computing and you know where are the intersection that happens with uh, the iot right well with a decentralized workforce and the rise of remote work we're going to be protecting the laptop we're going to be protecting the end user who has multiple devices and is not sitting behind a firewall in an office location actually so Protecting the edge is critically important. It's looking at where the traffic is coming from. It's identifying that. It's, it's looking for abnormalities on the network and inspecting that traffic and, and trusting that, that IT partner to do that, whether it's internal or external. Um, so we need to focus on the edge. That is where our workforce is. That is where our personal devices are. It's on the edge. Um, so how do we lock those down in the event of a breach? And it's, you know, it's simple things like using multi-factor authentication, which 85 or 80% of people just opt out of, which is crazy, according to like an IBM study. So, you know, we just need to make sure that we're leveraging tools like that. We're enforcing those policies um, and standardizing across the board. How this will be different than the traditional, because, you know, people get mis confused a little bit. They said, okay, but this is what the cloud is supposed to do. So how, how this is different from, you know, the cloud, because people thought that cloud allowed the decentralization. Uh, so how edge computing is different here? Absolutely. So we're still going to be leveraging the cloud. Don't get that misconstrued. So, you know, we're going to have data in the cloud. We're going to be running our large applications and AI models in the cloud, um, which that enables us to, to have our interface and have our, our edge, um, laptop, um, you know, anywhere. Uh, globally. So really what I'd like to say is we need to look at that edge computer in the event of whether it's a physical attack and somebody actually takes the device um, and gets access to it. Um, you know, how do we respond and, and lock it down um, or whether they get access to it as an entry point to your cloud server. So it's, it's really, you know, we need to look at the edge as the, the main and primary point of entry um, to those systems. Yeah, and to your point, make just you know, I asked the question on, on on purpose because you know my goal is always to uh, inspire and you know like let people think about these answers. So, and now I will try to to just like join things together. Cybersecurity we mentioned multiple times, right? So, and with with this IoT thing and AI. So, the thing is. Uh, and this is kind of a just a follow up of all what we have discussed so far with you, Nick. So, in order to have artificial intelligence, machine learning, you need data. And the data now, to Nick's point, is generated in a decentralized way where you can be sitting any part in the world, especially after the pandemic. And then you need to secure this data because without the data, you don't have AI, you don't have machine learning, you don't have all the nice things that you've seen. And this is why it's, it's extremely important to secure the data. 
and securing the data. And you would agree with me, Nick, I'm sure. It's not only about, you know, having a antivirus and just like simple stuff. Like things get so complicated, complicated in our world. And I want to, because, you know, we are taking now more a holistic approach to, to this thing. I want also to hear from the experts. What are like the cyber threats that we are seeing in the age of AI and machine learning and edge computing and, and internet of things? Right. Well, in order to protect the edge, you really have to have an application sit at the kernel level, which sits below the operating system. You need to be able to access and have control over every aspect of that machine. Well, um, so it's look, it's looking at the supply, everything from the supply chain, the Suez Canal, and what that did to to the, uh, to the world, right? It's, it's looking at supply chains. It's protecting every aspect of the business right down to the heart. Well, um, and then being able to lock it down and have. Absolutely. Uh, now I know, uh, you, you've, you've written a, a book, uh, deck yourself and it's called digitalization, the new normal of the post pandemic world. Uh, First, like, what are the takeaways, you know, uh, that you hope the readers will get? And, you know, the other thing that I want to ask you, like, are we heading to a place where the concept of work in general isn't the same that we used to have it, you know, a couple of decades ago? Where, where, where are we heading when it comes to future of work? We need to be adaptable. We need to be open to change and receptive to it. Um, you're going to see um, a lot of, we actually have a lot of uh, business owners retiring and, and selling or trying to sell their business to younger generations, right? We're going to see a workplace that um, age does not matter, right? Um, you're going to really, it's going to level the playing field here. So, um, you know, if those that put the work in are going to get ahead right now. It's just like the dot-com boom in the late 90s, early 2000s. It's a super exciting time. Um, but be open to it. Be open to change and get ahead of it. Otherwise, you're going to be left behind. Um, a lot of industries have, we've seen uh, digital transformation has taken place in every single industry from automotive to restaurants and outdoor dining. Like, we're amazing creatures. We've, we've adapted to... Um, a massive crisis and overcame it. Now we have to look at these new frontiers and ex be accepting of these tools and, and how they're going to change the way that we work. I will go back a little bit to AI here, Nick. And do you sure. think, uh, you know, related to this topic, do you think that AI and, you know, there's a lot of talks about the uh, autonomous bots and, uh, you know, these systems that you give them a complex set of tasks or let's say even project they decompose it into tasks they do it for you and then you come back so are we heading to a place where we need we can work less or let's say the type of tasks that we're gonna do or the type of work we're gonna do would be different than the one that we used to have done now since the uh, industrial revolution because you know we all know that you know when the industrial revolution started, so a lot of people were farmers and then they start to go to factories. And now, you know, like uh, we start to have the uh, blue coat, uh, like, uh, you know, workers and then, you know, the white color workers. So all this, all these concepts are changing. What, what do you expect in that space? Well, personally, I love what I do. Um, right. So it's important and you should like what you do. Um, you know, so I enjoy I enjoy my work. And, and that's really important. And that's, you know, that's a com common concept that um, was pre-1980 for a very long time. So, you know, I think you should enjoy your work. I think you should enjoy what you do. And, and AI is going to open that door for you. So let's continue to focus on that core message. You know, find an industry that you enjoy, whether it's real estate or military contracting or whatever it may be, beauty industry, find it. and then. Realize that, okay, sure, robots can do a lot of this work, but how can I be an integral part of what I'm passionate about? What are other, we talked a lot of, about technologies today and you mentioned some of them. So um, what are you seeing the key trends for this year, for 2024? 
um, from emerging technologies other than AI? Of course, AI will be here, but other than AI, what other emerging technologies are you expecting? And, you know, I'm not asking my guests anymore to do these analysis for five years because I think this is now risky <laughs> in this age. So I'm, I'm keeping it to one or two years from now. One or two years from now, we're going to continue to see the trend of, of remote work and, and reshaping the office culture and having these sort of hubs where people can collaborate and work together um, to build new tools um, to automate these mundane tasks. And it's going to be a fantastic um, new era for people. We're going to see um, just a tremendous rise in productivity. And um, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I think just the core message for me is, is making sure that we keep an eye out for cyber attacks and we make sure that operations are up and running and, and staying continued. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, we, we, need, we need to stay uh, uh, you know, alert to, to all these cyber attacks because I think they will, they will increase more. Uh, because more, the more we digitize, we more we, we rely on technology. And again, these bad guys, uh, they will be trying to, to disrupt, you know, what we're trying to do. So 100%. So Nick, as you know, we're, we're almost coming to an end. If you want to give us like what you're doing currently with, uh, you know, the, the platform that you mentioned, the Astute, right? So, uh, and, you know, where are you planning to take it? Absolutely. So I'm looking at the franchise model right now. I'm looking at leveraging my network to, to scale that out. Um, you know, can we get into places like Walmart? Can we uh, get into these local communities and these new cities that are being built um, all over the country? And then look at um, foreign markets like Dubai as well. Um, and then once we scale that system out, having it locally owned and operated, I think is really um, important, protecting our, our culture. Um, so, you know, I'm actually, you know, I'm looking at interesting things like, um, what is a uh, structure of a rifleman uh, hit squad in the U.S. Army? What does that look like? like? Can you have a staff leader? You know, it's typically about a group of a team of nine people. Um, how can you deploy those squads uh, throughout the country and then globally um, uh, strategically enough where they can service those communities, build those relationships with the local communities, um, and, and uh, really make sure that they protect um, their, their core, what makes them them. That's great. And uh, when people can find more about, about the platform and about yourself, Nick? Absolutely. So I have a website, astutetechnologist.com as well as I'm on every single social channel there is. I put out a lot of free resources, right? Uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch, but, um, you know, there's free resources out there. Educate yourself. Take advantage of these tools. Don't wait for the change. Get ahead of the change. Stay ahead of it. Um, stay ahead of the threats. Stay ahead of the cyber attacks read, right? I read a lot. I'm always staying current on the current news. I put out a lot of blog posts and, and interpret the news um, as a filter for my audience. So I, I put those messaging out there. I put it on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. I'm also guesting on several different podcasts. So I'm doing my world tour right now, which is great. Um, and then promoting my book because you can't really change a physical book, right? So at the end of the day, uh, my book, Digitalization, The New Normal of the Post-Pandemic World, is a great resource that tells you about all the current threats, as well as the fourth part to my book, which is the solution. That's fantastic. I will make sure that I will put the link uh, to, to let the audience go there. Uh, really, I really appreciate the time today like, on, on, on the show here and sharing your experience and what you're trying to do. It's a very rich, I would say, episode because we discussed plenty of things from AI to the SMB model when it comes to adopting technologies, plus, you know, cybersecurity, IoT, edge computing, and the future of work also as well. So I hope, you know, like everyone will, will, in, will benefit from this. And thank you for sharing your knowledge and thank you for sharing your perspective, I would say, with us today. And this is how usually I end, uh, you know, each episode. So this is for the audience. If you are first time here and, you know, you discovered our podcast, thank you for passing by. I hope that you enjoyed. If you liked it, please don't hesitate to subscribe. If you are listening to on your favorite podcasting platform, so just subscribe to the podcast. And if you found us on YouTube, again, subscribe and share this with your friends and colleagues. And if you are one of the 
fans that keep coming back again and again. Thank you very much for your loyalty and thank you for your you know, nice messages and compliments you write me. And thank you also for the feedback you give me from time to time. I really appreciate I read all your messages. I don't drop any single message. So thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for your compliments. And if you are interested in being in the show, this is something I repeat at the end of each episode. Don't hesitate. If you are on a mission to change something, if you are a founder and you are not finding a space to go out to the world and tell them about what you're doing, please don't hesitate. Reach out. This is why the show is here and we can make it happen. Thank you very much for tuning in. We'll meet again in a new episode. Thank you. Hit that subscribe button, share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs, and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.